Hello listeners, this is Clarin Kodamanchali speaking, your host for today's episode, which is a talk given by Dr. Nitish Dogra, Associate Professor, IIHMR Delhi, on the topic Pollution and Diseases. This talk is a part of the 10th IC Innovator Club meeting. Let us hear from Dr. Nitish. Hello. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. V.K. Singh, uh, Surgeon Rear Ad Admiral V.K. Singh, uh, for this invitation. Uh, sir is our uh, founder director at IHMR Delhi, and we have very fond memories of his time with us, and he has uh, really built uh, the foundation of our institute and uh, taken it. Uh, is a main person responsible, I would say, uh, for where we are today, because he was the founder director. So uh, having said so, thank you, uh, Devlina, uh, for the invitation, the introduction. Uh, so uh, I don't want to say much because uh, one, you heard a lot, uh, and uh, also uh, Amit ji has uh, as an innovator, uh, he has uh, already brought out something really uh, fascinating. And uh, before that, uh, whatever he was mentioning about uh, the health aspects, that's uh, bang on. <clears throat> so uh, to begin, all I'll say is my own journey, and not too much, but just to put in context, so the first time I actually studied air pollution was uh, year 2000, believe it or not, uh, before there was, uh, at that time, there was hardly anybody in the country probably looking at this whole issue. And uh, I was doing this as part of my MD thesis. I was uh, doing my MD in physiology at the Patel Chest Institute uh, in uh, Delhi. <clears throat> and my thesis was on how, um, the indoor air pollution affects the health of uh, school going children uh, from uh, low income settings. So uh, that was a, a very uh, important deep dive, uh, very good learning. And uh, uh, from there, uh, I somehow find, found my way uh, to the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health uh, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, to Dr. Jonathan Samet, who was uh, uh, the chair of epidemiology and uh, uh, a guru in uh, global tobacco control. Uh, <clears throat> after uh, my MPS there, uh, I came back and uh, after uh, a couple of months uh, working with INCLIN, the International Clinical Epidemiology Network, I joined Terry, where uh, my remit was working on environmental health. Uh, so uh, that was the story then. It was still not considered important at that time. Um, but then uh, since I was at Terry, uh, one of the developments was that uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was headed by Dr. Pachori, uh, that uh, got the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, so Terry, uh, where Dr. Pachori was the head, uh, that a uh, lot of work began on how climate change impacts health. And so the better part of 10 years I spent in that area, uh, I uh, started off at uh, IHMR at, in uh, uh, 2009. Uh, I had finished one small project on climate and health here at uh, Terry. And then uh, <clears throat> when I moved on to IHMR, when Dr. Uh, V.K. Singh was there. He was very encouraging on continuing that work on uh, the impact of climate change on health. Uh, mind you, that was 2009. Uh, when, again, in that whole area also, there was uh, practically no one. So uh, that journey continued. And then uh, in the last five years, especially 2015, 16, when the air pollution, uh, you know, kind of skyrocketed. Uh, that's when I again got more active in that specific area, which was my MD thesis area. And <clears throat> I also, like Amilji, was involved in activism uh, 
Uh, we did a small neighborhood experiment in which uh, we used to have an air quality monitor that I used to uh, have in my balcony. And every morning I used to take the air quality readings and then uh, through WhatsApp, send it to our morning walkers group. And <clears throat> eventually we kind of calibrated and kind of figured out you know, what uh, levels are okay to go out for a walk, what levels one should not go, what should, what should one do in between and so on. And uh, it was something which was very well appreciated. Um, it was picked up by the media, the newspaper. There was a video made on it by Al Jazeera. Uh, BBC covered it. And uh, that was it. So we just continued with that work. And that was about that aspect. You know, it was just something we did. A couple of talks I gave. <clears throat> but uh, in 2019, I was really honored, uh, delighted that my own university, Johns Hopkins University, uh, in their wisdom uh, awarded, uh, uh, I received a Community Hero Award from uh, the Johns Hopkins University. So um, that was the activism part, but we also did a, a, some, some science along the way. Uh, and uh, this included two projects with uh, the Central Road Research Institute, one on how the first time users of the Metro, the commuters, how they uh, benefited in terms of air quality and also uh, in terms of physical activity. And, also, and the second project, on how traffic impacts the health of school children. Uh, the results of that we are um, in the process of uh, assessing. So uh, that's about the research, the activism dimension. Uh, we also serve as uh, a, a center of excellence for vulnerability assessment for the national program for climate change and human health. There are some 16 institutes associated with that. And uh, the national program also includes air pollution uh, besides climate change. So that is about me and the work we do. Uh, now to very briefly take you through, you know, how we in as epidemiologists always look at problems. Uh, so in descriptive epidemiology, we say we have <clears throat> six uh, honest men, right? So the why, when, where, who, what, and how, right? So, and just, uh, I would like to touch upon six aspects, how I look at it in terms of answering these six questions, some of which has been covered, but uh, in, uh, it, it's uh, important to again uh, dwell on it. So I'll, I'll go first to the health aspects, uh, which is uh, my area, but it's all interconnected. So I will uh, even, though I'm a health scientist per se, but since uh, we work in the environment field, I will still uh, just mention what I feel is the way to go about the air quality puzzle. So uh, when we say who is affected, you know, we, we say, of course, children, elderly, pregnant women, those with comorbid conditions, those outdoors, uh, you know, like uh, traffic policemen, but <clears throat> particularly, a pregnant woman. I think that is one category we miss in our thinking. Uh, there is uh, worldwide evidence that uh, there is a reduction in birth weight as a result of air pollution. We still don't know what is the implication in India, but with the high levels of pollution, this is certainly a matter which we really need more evidence and it would have nutritional consequences. But immaterial of the evidence, I think uh, pregnant women obviously need to take extra care, you know, uh, at such, such times. I've had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, husbands, uh, uh, to be fathers, you know, asking me, should we uh, take our wife to, you know, less polluted, you know, and to their home or whatever in the village, you know, or, or smaller town. So, yeah, that is a concern. Then, uh, the other point is, uh, yeah, why we should be concerned, uh, which is uh, that it's, this is exactly where I will, you know, agree fully with Amitji that we just have too much focus on the lungs, whereas actually it is the heart which has, uh, which has been shown to have a tremendous 
uh, impact. I mean, air quality really impacts the art, and that is something we are just not even recognizing um, as a phenomena, definitely. Uh, and uh, more than that, I think, uh, I mean, I won't say more, but at least as of now, we I can say that the brain aspect is uh, has been totally overlooked. Uh, we are not considering the more than 200 studies that we have worldwide, which are clearly telling us that uh, IQ is affected in children, that uh, it affects Alzheimer's in adults uh, in, in, in the elderly, and uh, depression uh, could be one of the impacts in both. And, and there could be several other impacts. It, it definitely goes past the blood-brain barrier, uh, PM 2.5 or lesser, uh, size particles can uh, enter uh, the brain and cause uh, structural damage. This is something which is so worrying and I, I, I don't understand how uh, we don't have, uh, you know, enough uh, pressure or enough momentum on this aspect, you know, on something that is affecting our brain is not something that should be uh, taking, taken lying down. So we are uh, having a generation who have brains which are the, the brain which is being affected, which is a very, very critical matter. Then uh, the other aspect is uh, uh, where we should be acting. Uh, so uh, this is here now I'll, I'll uh, like to say that, uh, you know, we always think of high AQI, which is uh, all very well. But, you know, if it's with high AQI, you know, there is a parabolic relationship between health and the outcome. So you have uh, adverse impacts at a higher level, but that they plateau out. And therefore, if you have uh, beneficial effects at a lower level, then you actually get overall more benefit from the health perspective. So effectively that what it means is if you're moving from 400 to 350 and uh, 200 to 150, when all other things, including population density, et cetera, are the same, it is the 200 to 150 where you will get more health benefits rather than 400 to 350. So that's something that needs to be considered. Our, our uh, towns and cities where pollution is now rising uh, we shouldn't overlook that. We should be ready with our plans there. The other part is uh, when uh, uh, we should be uh, moving out. I think that is known, uh, like mostly in the 10 to 4 sort of time uh, in the winter. So we need to modify. That part, I think, is, is fairly clear. But from a, a all of society and the air quality perspective, I think that message that we have to act all around the year and not just in winters, like Sir was also mentioning, you know, that is very, very critical, you know, because uh, unless you lower baseline in summers, you will not be able to lower the baseline in winters and uh, therefore not make the impact that you need uh, in, and you will have this winter phenomena endlessly. So we are already into our sixth year, which is uh, something which is a now become an international shame, you know, so we know that and the way it's affecting business, as Amaji also rightly pointed out, you know, these are very important considerations. Then, so just two more points and I'll end here. So one is uh, this whole uh, issue of prop burning. That's what I will call as the what aspect in my, the way I view it. So what can we do and with prop burning being such a essential issue, which I'm mentioning, uh, there are others. Uh, such as, of course, vehicles uh, and road dust, etc., industries, power plants. Uh, but I'll just get to that. The main point about crop burning uh, is that, you know, it has these economic consequences, these medical consequences, say, on Delhi, for example. Now, you could compute that. And uh, if there was a way in which that money could be, could be transferred to uh, Punjab, Haryana, wherever, right? And you actually ensure uh, that the crop is picked up and converted to energy. I know it's a simplistic what I'm saying, but what I'm what I'm trying to mention is that if there is interstate cooperation and 
uh, including uh, monetary aid, then this problem can be solved. And once it is solved, if the crop uh, residue issue is solved, it's uh, something which uh, is, is going to take away a huge expenditure, medical expenditure, which comes in every year. And not only suffering, but also deaths, which uh, we don't even have the exact numbers. And the other issue that is there in the whole emissions game, so to say, is that there is a, a very idealistic uh, sort of notion, which I've even heard from uh, very prominent air quality scientists that, you know, we should address every source of emission. Now, that is just not feasible, not needed. It goes against Pareto principle. You should just go on the most important components, most important sources. So that's here in, in Delhi, it would be say vehicles and dust, road dust or other sources, industries and power plants. That's it. If you just do this, you would have solved Delhi's air quality problem. Don't look at anything else. But unfortunately, it's like going after every source and not getting anything done. So this is this is what I have to say. This is the how part, how the whole problem should be solved. And so those are the six issues. Sorry, I've uh, exceeded a little bit, but uh, I thought I will try to cover whatever possible. Very, it's a subject that I'm very passionate about having been involved uh, since year 2000. Thank you, Dr. Nitish. To watch the complete club meeting on this topic, visit the link in the description below. Subscribe to the channel to get instant access to all the podcasts. Follow us on social media through the links available in the description below. Thank you all for spending your time in listening to the week's episode. Look out for a new episode every Wednesday, published on Google Podcasts, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you are interested in hosting your podcast with us, fill the form available in the description below. Thank you once again and stay safe. See you next time.